Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. The case that I'm going to be looking into today is the unsolved mystery of Mr. Cruel. Mr. Cruel, as he was dubbed in the media, is actually one of Australia's most notorious criminals. And this was actually a case that one of you guys suggested for me to look into. I won't mention names in case they don't want to be mentioned, but if you do suggest cases and don't mind me actually mentioning your name, please do let me know because obviously I will do that. I just don't want to put anybody in a situation they don't want to be in. But I really appreciate suggestions, so thank you so much for suggesting this case. I'd just like to say I've gathered all this information from the internet. I don't mean any disrespect to anyone I'm going to talk about today. And this video is for educational purposes. Although it's widely believed that Mr. Cruel was actually responsible for a dozen attacks on children in the northeast suburbs of Melbourne, Victoria, only four crimes have actually been attributed to Australia's boogeyman, as some people like to call him, and these were actually committed in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Mr. Cruel would plan out his attacks meticulously. He would survey the families of the victims and the victims themselves to ensure basically that he never left any evidence behind that could lead to his discovery. With planning out these crimes so meticulously, it would mean that he'd know the family's routine. He'd know who was with who and when. And basically this allowed him to commit these crimes without getting detected. He always hid his face. He was just so careful to make sure that he wouldn't get caught. He also did things like leaving red herrings behind for the families and for the police to kind of throw them off his scent. And police did describe him as highly intelligent. He was meticulous, he was callous, and the police do believe that he was likely highly involved in his community. And he was probably even considered a nice guy by his neighbours. And this is just so scary. It, you don't really know who anybody is. And it's just awful to think that one of your neighbours who you thought was a nice guy would do such crimes. So on the 22nd of August in 1987, situated in the suburb of Lower Plenty, a man broke into a house around 4am. He was armed with a gun and a knife. This man went on to bind the hands and the feet of both parents. He covered their eyes with surgical tape and he went and locked them in a wardrobe. He went around and he cut the phone lines to the house to make sure that nobody could ring for any help. He would then blindfold and gag their six-year-old son and tie him to the bed. But the son wasn't his target. He targe then targeted their 11-year-old daughter. Now, he had kind of a ritual and people find it very odd. So basically he made her brush her teeth and then he assaulted her. He then told her that she could free her parents after she had counted to 100 very, very slowly. And he would actually spend a total of two hours in this first victim's house. And he even went as far as making himself a meal. He was so cool and he had calculated everything that he just wasn't even worried that somebody would come in and surprise him, he stuck around for two hours, he fed himself. He was just that confident, basically. Now, the identity of this family was never actually disclosed. And to be honest, I don't really blame them. Keeping their name out of the media and things like that just ensured the privacy. They didn't want anyone to know who they was, and it's totally understandable. On the 27th of December, 1988, in the suburb of Ringwood, at around 5.30 a.m., Mr. Cruel broke into the back door of the Wills house. Once more, he was armed with a handgun and a knife. He tied up the parents, John and Julie, with a copper wire and then he gagged them before demanding money from them and threatening them with his handgun. He then abducted one of their four daughters, 10-year-old Sharon Wills. He put tape over her eyes and gagged her mouth. And he actually kept her for a total of 18 hours before he ended up releasing her on the grounds of Bayswater High School and she was found wearing a man's shirt carrying green garbage bags. Again, as I said with the ritual, it's like he liked to make sure that they were clean in a sense, I guess. Sharon told the police that he made her have a shower. He made her actually brush and floss her teeth and he even gave her food while he was assaulting her. 
He had actually kept her blindfolded throughout the ordeal. And it's believed that she was so lucky that she didn't actually remove this blindfold, at least when he was around, because who knows what he would have done to her. Again, she was only 10 years old. She was only really young. She would have been so frightened and so terrified. At that age, she might not have realised that removing a blindfold would put her in such danger. I mean, some, some are aware, some aren't. But it's just a tender age, isn't it? And it's just really lucky that she actually didn't. Because if she would have seen his face, then it might have been a different story for Sharon. Nearly two years later, on the 3rd of July in 1990, in the eastern suburb of Canterbury, Mr. Cruel strikes again. He broke in to Brian and Rosemary at Linus's house, who were actually out for dinner at the time with friends, but they'd actually left their two daughters at home, Fiona, who was 15, and Nicola, who was 13. He threatened both his sisters with a gun and a knife before forcing Nicola into a stolen rental car. And he even forced her to bring a school uniform. He then took Nicola to a separate house where he kept her there and abused her for a total of 50 hours. Again, he made a brush of teeth. He made her wash herself thoroughly. He actually fed and watered her regularly throughout the whole ordeal. And she even remarked that Mr. Cruel sat and watched the press conference where Nicola's parents pleaded for a return and he even dis sat and discussed it with her. Mr. Cruel told Nicola that he would actually release her after keeping her captive for 50 hours. And that's exactly what he did. She was found blindfolded and wrapped in a blanket at a power substation in the suburb of Coo. He also told her that he'd been watching her walk home from school. So basically, he wasn't afraid to talk to his victims. He'd have normal conversations with them. He would feed them, water them, all whilst he was abusing them. And it was at this point that the police actually had a description of their suspect. He was a Caucasian male of medium build with a pot belly, aged between 30 and 50, and was around about 5'8 to 5'10. He had fair sandy hair, spoke with an Australian accent, and used old fashioned phrases such as worry war and bozo. One year later, on the 13th of April 1991, in the suburb of Templestowe, a male abducted 13-year-old Carmaine Chan from her home. Her parents, John and Phyllis, had owned a Chinese restaurant. They were out at work at the time, leaving behind Carmaine, Carly, who was nine, and Karen, who was seven, all at home. Now, Carmaine actually went to the same school as Nicola Linus, so I don't know, maybe like he had admitted to Nicola that he'd watched her walking home from school, maybe he'd actually watched Carmaine, watched Carmaine walking home from school also. They went to the same school, maybe that's how he picked her as his next target. He forced the sisters into a wardrobe at knife point and then simply disappeared with Carmaine. Her parents, absolutely distraught, like anyone would be, did media appeals for the safe return of their daughter. And the sisters even drew a picture of the man what the man looked like that took her. Unfortunately, the media appeals didn't really release any new information. And just one year later, on the 9th of April in 1992, Kamein Chan's badly decomposing body was discovered. She was discovered by a dog walker near a landfill site at Thomastown. And she had suffered three gunshot wounds to the head. Mr. Cruel was actually suspected of committing this crime. But there hasn't really been enough evidence to make a proper judgment as to whether he did or did not commit this crime. But again, needless to say, he is widely suspected by many out there that he did. However, some detectives do have their doubts about it. If this was one of Mr. Krull's victims, he certainly did escalate. And you can see that he was escalating anyway from how long he kept these girls. Like I said, the first he spent two hours with, the next he then spent 18 hours with, and the one after that he spent a full 50 hours with before he released them. He seemed like he was becoming more self-assured and wanted to spend more time with his victims. And it's, it is believed that that's why he was abducting them. Obviously, it's hard to spend so much time in somebody's house. So to go into somebody's house like he did with the first case, he only managed to spend two hours there. He didn't want to spend too long there to raise suspicion. So that's why in the next one, he actually abducted her and took her somewhere else so he could keep her for longer. All of his other victims were eventually released, thankfully. So why did he take her main life? If, like I said, this was actually a Mr. Cruel's victim. 
Well, it's actually believed that possibly Kermain actually saw his face. Maybe she recognised him and that's why he took her life. None of his surviving victims ever saw his face. He covered it with a black balaclava and this had white stitching around the eyes and the mouth. Or, like I said with one of the victims, he blindfolded them. So, if he wasn't wearing his mask, they were blindfolded so his identity was protected either way. So he wasn't worried about he wasn't worried about his victim actually seeing his face, but what if Kermain actually did? I really do believe that this is the most likely reason why. I mean, it might not be, it's simply just a theory. Again, I do believe this theory myself, but we just don't know what happened. These cases are so sad. How terrified these young girls must have been and their parents. They were just so innocent and so young. And personally, I'm thankful that he did release the three girls. And it really does break my heart that he did steal the life of 13-year-old Kermain Chan. Of course, the other girls will have scars. They will be traumatised and physically and mentally. But at least these girls did have the chance to rebuild their lives. And unfortunately, Kermain wasn't so lucky. And it's just, it's just horrendous. It just really breaks my heart to think about it. The police did extensive investigations and the girls really did try their best to aid the police in the investigation. Sharon Wills gave the police crucial information that they are still hoping will eventually crack the case. So the girls were occasionally able to sneak kind of glances around the rooms that they were in, obviously when he wasn't there and it's lucky that he didn't see them because again, who knows what might have happened. He may have taken the lives for actually seeing his face. And despite his warnings not to remove the blindfolds, they did in certain rooms and one was actually able to describe the bedroom that she was kept in. It had a beige or cream carpet, peach full length curtains, a double bed with a peach headboard, an orange lamp base, a lemon lampshade with thin white vertical stripes. It had light walls and a white door. And this is actually the image that was drawn up off this description. She also said that a dark blanket covered a bookcase or a cabinet and this was at the opposite end of the room from the bed and it was possibly to hide identifiable possessions. They managed to describe the bathroom. It had a triple sliding door to the shower and a sink next to the shower door. You actually had to get past the sink to get in the shower. The dual flush toilet was very close to the bathroom and they described Mr. Krull as having access to firearms and that he was sometimes armed with 35 centimetre kitchen knife. They must have been so frightened. Kermain's murder, which was now 28 years ago, was actually the last attack that was attributed to Miss Krull. Over the next couple of years, Task Force Spectrum would examine 30,000 houses and actually eliminate 27,000 people of interest from their inquiries. They even went on to create a poster of the faces of the three victims along with the names and these were then distributed to 1.4 million households. Over the years there's been so many investigations and a lot of profiling of Mr. Cruel. And it is now believed that he did actually have a more complicated pattern of offending than previously thought. Forensic psychologist Tim Watson Munro, who did profile him, actually believes he doesn't just have an attraction to young children. The profile that he did actually included previous detention and sexual assaults of adult women not known to the public. In one of the attacks, he raped an elderly nun. He then stole a bank card and then drove her car to an ATM where he actually stole her savings. Tim actually suggested that Mr. Krull had become desensitised to the extreme sadism and brutality he inflicted on his adult victims and then turned to children. At one point, this was obviously prior to 2018, the police actually did think that the notorious Golden State Killer from the US was actually operating on Australian soil. And this was due to the such similarities in their behaviour. However, after the Golden State Killer's capture in 2018, investigators were actually able to rule him out as being Mr. Cruel, which meant that Australia's long-running mystery remains, to this day, unsolved. It is possible that Mr. Cruel actually stopped abducting children after Carmaine's murder. Maybe he didn't want it to escalate that far and just stopped doing it entirely. 
he may also have passed away, he may be in prison, or he may have even moved on to a new area and continued his crimes there. He was never identified and his three confirmed attacks and suspected murder remain unsolved cold cases, unfortunately. In April 2016, 25 years after the abduction and murder of Kermain Chan, the Victoria Police actually increased the reward for information that leads to Mr. Krull's arrest and his possible conviction from $100,000 to $1 million. So again, guys, if any of you do have any information that could lead to a break in this case, then please do contact the relevant authorities and possibly Mr. Cruel can finally face justice for the crimes that he committed. Let's get this, the word spread about Mr. Cruel because personally I hadn't actually heard of him. So it's good to do videos like this and to try and spread the word further. Maybe someone out there does know something and we can finally get justice for these families for the abduction of their daughters, the abuse and the unfortunate murder of Kermain. As I said, this was a suggested case and if anyone else would like to suggest any more cases, please do let me know in the comments below and I will look into them. Also, let me know if you want your name to be revealed as to whether you suggested it or not because some people might not like that. Anyway guys, that's all I have today on the unsolved case of Mr. Cruel. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, bye!